everyone and welcome and we are going to get started. Today's session is around age-friendly public health systems focused on 4M, the 4Ms for healthcare practitioners. Our presenters today will be Dr. Nushira Pandya, Isabel Rovira, which is myself, and Dr. Kevin O'Neill. By the end of this series, we're hoping that you all will be able to really understand the need for age-friendly health systems, be able to communicate the 4M model and identify your scope, role, and opportunities to practice the 4Ms in the healthcare setting. Today's session is module one of four. We're going to be hosting this event every Thursday in June, starting with today. And today is an introduction and we'll dive deeper as we go through the different uh, sessions the rest of the month. And so today's module, we'll start with an introduction. We're going to talk about at the higher level what's happening with the age-friendly social movement. And then we'll get a great overview on these age-friendly health systems and the four Ms. I want to introduce to you now, Dr. Nushira Pandya. She is a professor and chair of the geriatrics department at NSU, Karen C. Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine, and the, the project director of the HRSA funded Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. She is a certified medical director and a ger geriatrics fellowship program director with an active clinical practice in which she teaches health profession students, residents, and fellows. Dr. Pandya is past president of MD. AMDA, the National Society for Post-Acute and Long-Term Care Medicine, and past chair of the Interdisciplinary Clinical Practice Committee. She has participated in the development of multiple clinical guidelines and position statements, and is recognized for her work in the area of diabetes in the elderly. She is a board certified in internal medicine, geriatrics, and endocrinology and metabolism, and holds the distinction of being a Fulbright Senior Specialist Scholar. Please welcome Dr. Pandya, and I will hand it over to her. Welcome. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rivera. It's a real pleasure to be here. Will I be able to advance my slides? or I can advance them for okay, you. Okay, that's fine. So what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about today is our Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Program and where we fit in uh, this age-friendly healthcare movement and age-friendly public health uh, systems movement. And so we're uh, one of the 44 or so federal grantees by the Health Resource Service Administration uh, to develop a geriatrics workforce enhancement program. Uh, we're in this, nearing the second year completion of our program. It's a five-year grant. Uh, next slide. And uh, the reason uh, these uh, programs developed initially, uh, the funding was for geriatric education centers. Uh, the focus was on educating all kinds of health professionals in uh, aspects of elder care and in geriatric medicine, but it evolved into uh, developing a, a more a capable and competent workforce. So this is a collaborative venture between our medical school at NSU, the Kiran C. Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine. We have eight, uh, actually we have now more interprofessional uh, and interdisciplinary collaborators. We also have academic partners, Florida Atlantic University and other partners who I'll show, and graduate medical education sites, primary care delivery sites, so this is a very outward facing grant and several community based organizations. And this whole uh, idea arose because of the shortage of geriatric care specialists, not just physicians, but all healthcare professionals taking care of the elderly. So uh, we are trying, one of our goals is to geriatricize the workforce. Next slide. And just to show you the structure of our grant, we have several academic partners, uh, Florida Atlantic University, uh, and then graduate medical uh, education. We have Aventura Hospital, Larkin Community Hospital, and Community Health Institute of, uh, of Florida. So these places have residency programs and fellowship programs. 
We also partner with care delivery sites and our NSU clinics being the main one, but also Cano Health, which has over 44 uh, or so senior care centers in the community and moving outside of Florida and also Community Health Institute of Florida. So these are our clinical partners, very important in this project. And our community-based partners, you can see listed on the bottom right. And of course, Urban Health Partnerships is our our newest partner and we're very excited to work with you. Next slide. So just to go over the goals of this grant and you'll see where we fit in with age-friendly healthcare. The first goal is to develop partnerships as I've shown you between academia, delivery sites, community-based uh, organizations to collectively train a workforce uh, that will provide better uh, health outcomes for older adults. The second goal is to really training base, to train healthcare providers, other health professionals, students, fellows, faculty members, in order to address the needs of older adults. Next slide. The third goal is the most important, uh, and uh, this is where age-friendly health systems fits in. This is to transform clinical care environments into integrated geriatrics and uh, into integrated geriatrics and primary care systems so that they become age-friendly health systems and they're well positioned for value-based care. And of course, the uh, changes in the payment system and alternative payment models. And we're actually following the merit-based incentive payment system. So some of our target goals um, actually have been achieved. You know, With every grant, there are target goals of how many practitioners we reach, what changes we can bring about, and um, we have now achieved level one Institute of Healthcare Improvement certification and are well on our way to getting level two uh, IHI certification as an age-friendly health system. Uh, next slide. Uh, the fourth goal is to deliver community-based programs to help patients, families, caregivers, and direct care workers with the knowledge and skills to improve healthcare outcomes. And the fifth goal is uh, basically based on Alzheimer's uh, and related dementias. So we want to provide training and we are providing training to actually several thousand people by now. Uh, in terms of family members, caregivers, and the healthcare workforce on uh, Alzheimer's and related dementias. And um, this training also goes into primary care sites uh, that are dementia friendly sites. And, uh, you know, the REDS uh, are target goal numbers. And I think even in the second year of our grant, we are well on our way to achieving uh, the numbers of people we want to reach and train. But of course, this is not all about numbers. We want to show uh, improved outcomes. Uh, next slide. So I'll go a little bit more into detail in a second about age-friendly healthcare. But to tell you about the web, we were also uh, recipients of a COVID-19 supplemental grant that uh, uh, HRSA uh, uh, rolled out. And we've completed this grant, it ended um, uh, at the end of April. And there were three main goals to enhance readiness to respond to COVID-19 through telehealth technologies, uh, promote the use of telehealth. And we, our, our role was to um, distribute tablets to uh, older adults uh, through South Florida Institute of Aging and through our own clinical settings. Uh, these were loaded with clinical materials to help patients and families navigate and access resources during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we provide, the third goal was to provide access to healthcare technologies in order to actually access healthcare, promote telehealth visits. Um, we also, as part of this initiative, made a, a large number of wellness calls and telehealth calls um, to meet the needs of older adults. And that actually, provided a valuable sort of connection to patients who were uh, isolated, helped them to get connected to their healthcare providers and help them to receive important information. Next slide. So you'll hear a lot about age-friendly uh, healthcare. And of course, we're using the Institute of Healthcare Improvement model, uh, what matters most. And uh, that includes preferences and values on what older adults want 
including discussions on advanced care planning, uh, appropriate use of medication so we avoid mishaps and medication usage that falls within uh, the goals of the older adult and doesn't impair the other areas of their lives, especially mobility and mentation. And mentation, the big areas are uh, to identify delirium, depression, and uh, dementia. And mobility, of course, we want to maintain function, reduce fall-related injuries, help to maintain a quality of life that older adults can, um, uh, you know, desire. And that uh, reduces the need for institutionalization and more intervention type care. Next slide. So just to give an example, what matters to, to an older adult, let's say in the hospital setting. So these 4M, uh, this 4M framework is relevant in many different settings, but in a, a hospitalized adult, uh, what would help if there were advanced care planning discussions, uh, goal related discussions would be uh, to reduce unwanted ICU days in the hospital, for example. Appropriate medication use would reduce adverse drug events and possibly delirium, which is so common in hospitals, often related to medications, but to illness and to the procedures that are carried out. And um, that will also affect mobility. We want to reduce in falls related with injuries. We do want to reduce pressure sores and venous uh, thromboembolism. So even in that small uh, uh, area of the hospitalized older adults, you can see that applying the 4M framework could lead to better outcomes. Next slide. So what has been our strategy for integrating the 4Ms? Uh, so I'm just gonna focus on our setting. One of the big steps was uh, we uh, employed a clinical trainer who is uh, Denise Krasinski, works part-time with us, has a lot of experience with older adults. So she is a dedicated trainer. We've integrated the concepts, the 4M concepts into training for residents, for all the residencies that we're affiliated to and fellowships into their didactics, into their, you know, um, uh, curriculum and uh, as part of their training. So mostly uh, Denise and I have participated in these trainings. And these have gone on into the health clinical setting itself. We've actually been to clinics, uh, discussed with practitioners, we've uh, trained our clinical staff. And of course, this is a work in progress. We really wish like everything else, we were further along than we really are. Um, so Many clinicians have been trained already in our system and within the Cano Health uh, system, clinic staff have been trained. And we've utilized clinical informatics to incorporate uh, some of the uh, key components of the four Ms uh, into the electronic healthcare system. So our goal is to have practitioners be able to access these areas easily, like safe medication management, fall risk assessment, uh, advanced care planning. So it's readily visible, uh, available, and it falls within uh, you know, the heatest measures and the quality measures we're trying to meet. So that's been a big uh, step in uh, simplifying uh, the reach of the electronic healthcare system so that practitioners can actually you know, be aware of the 4M system, uh, framework and actually capture it by documenting, by asking the questions that are actually in the electronic healthcare record. Next slide. So what we've uh, used for data collection through the electronic healthcare system, we've utilized the six merit-based incentive payment system measures. And we've also added uh, opioid screening, which uh, is uh, obviously a large, you know, um, it's a, an important imperative nationally in view of uh, the high mortality and morbidity with opioid addiction. So the measures we have used are blood pressure control, uh, diabetes management, uh, A1C being the surrogate measure, uh, fall risk screening, uh, dementia caregiver education, that has been the measure we've used uh, for the uh, mentation part. Medication management, so we uh, will screen our medication use for uh, certain safe practices, advanced care planning discussions, and we have employed a tool for a screening for opioid misuse, which is incorporated into our 
um, electronic health record uh, system. Next slide. So um, I want to end here and thank you for all your interest and expertise in this area. And I look forward to being part of this uh, event uh, for the next few weeks. So thank you so much. It's about Thank you so much, Dr. Pandya. This is a, a really great overview of the GWEP program and what they're doing with the four M's and really ties it into what why we're here today. And I wanna go uh, even a little bit further back to uh, really around the age-friendly social movement, why we should be doing this, why we should be focusing on older adults and also what's happening here in Florida, especially in South Florida. I have no relevant disclosures and I, I want, to share. I am with Urban Health Partnerships. I'm a, the co-founder and COO, and we're focused on investing in communities by co-designing sustainable change and promoting equity and well-being across the lifespan. So the focus of our work is really on building a culture of health equity, and we do this by focusing on healthy streets and public spaces, food access, security, and justice, and age-friendly communities for longevity, which is why we're here today. And we really ground all of our work in community-driven leadership, working with community partners and leaders and residents to be able to achieve health in our community. And why we're here today is because we're all getting older. Our populations across the world are getting older. Um, in this graphic, you can see in 2015, we had about 900 million older adults, 60 and over in our, in our world and it's expected that by 2050 we'll have over 2 billion. Um, so that's a big jump and it will represent about 22 percent of the entire population in our world. And this population aging is happening more quickly than in the past and you see that here in this graphic and in the U.S. this is happening as well. The number of Americans age 65 and older are expected to more than double by 2060. And for the first time in US history, older adults are projected to outnumber children by 2034. This is uh, for the, the country as a whole, but this has actually already happened in a lot of areas in Florida. In Miami-Dade County, this has already happened. And in other, a couple of other counties, this is already or expected to happen very soon. So we need to be thinking about how are we supporting aging in our community? And in this graphic, I hope it, there we go. Um, you can see that it's, this is the median age by county between 1970 and 2040. You see as the years go by that our counties, different counties median ages are continuing to get darker, uh, meaning that it's, it's uh, going up in median age and this is expected to continue. So how do we, why is this happening? So first, it's really for, because of two things. We have falling fertility rates, people are having less children, and we have increased life expectancy because of modern medicine, because of our healthcare system and the support that we have in our communities, we're all living longer. It's expected that if we get to six years old, we can expect to live 20 more years. So we've been able to add these years to, to our lives, but really how do we add life to our years? Make sure that every year is one that is that helps us to thrive and that we are able to enjoy as long as possible. How will these extra years be spent? It really, really depends on health and the systems and supports that we have in place to be able to do this. The World Health Organization defines healthy aging as being able to do the things we value for as long as possible. And health in older age is not random. It, it's, it is uh, based uh, by, on genetic inheritance in part, but that is a small part. It's also based on who we are. And it's also based on a lifetime of where we live, on our healthy behaviors, and also on our access to healthcare and what that looks like. And every older person is different. So some um, at, at one age may have the level of functioning of a 30 year old and some may require full assistance for basic everyday needs. And really health is crucial to how we experience older age and the older years in our lives. But World Health Organization 
tells us that every person in every country in the world should have the opportunity to live a long and healthy life. And it's about creating environments and opportunities that enable people to be able to do what they value. So again, we see here what influences older age. We have our behaviors, our age-related changes, our genetics and our diseases, but also the, the way that we are able to support us being able to function in, in our communities, the housing, the assistive technologies, the transportation, the social facilities, and the healthcare systems that we have in place. And I want to highlight that healthy aging is not a cost, it's an investment. So if we invest in health systems, in long-term care, in lifelong learning and age-friendly environments and in social protections, we'll see benefits in health, in skills and knowledge, in mobility, in social connectivity, in financial security and personal dignity and safety and security for individuals, leading to individual well-being, but, but also to workforce participation, to consumption, to entrepreneurship and investment in our communities, to innovation and social and cultural contributions and to social cohesions. So really investing in healthy aging is investing in our communities and all of our futures. So what's needed for healthy aging? One is a change in the way we think about aging and older people. We want people to value aging. Um, we hear a lot about anti-aging, um, you know, beating aging, but really being able to age is a privilege and being able to age in our communities and being able to help age with health is really important. And we want to be able to have people value that. We need to create age friendly envi environments to support that. We need to be able to align our health systems to the needs of older people. And we need to develop systems of long-term care to support older adults as well. And all of this can be supported through what has recently been coined as this age-friendly social movement. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these components. So first is this age-friendly communities and age-friendly cities initiative. So this is actually was started by the World Health Organization in 2006. And they, initiative, they initiated a movement to create age-friendly communities, which are those that encourage active aging by optimizing opportunities for health, participation and security in order to enhance quality of life as people age. So there is a worldwide network of age-friendly cities and communities. And when cities sign on to this network, they're actually signing on to a process. It's not just saying, yes, I wanna be age-friendly. It's actually signing on to this process where they're surveying the community, developing a plan, implementing the plan and evaluating it, and then starting all over again. So it's a, lo a, a long-term process to make their community more age-friendly. So today we have about 1,100 uh, cities, municipalities, states across the world that are part of this network. They represent 44 countries. And here in the US, AARP collaborates with the World Health Organization. So here in the US, if somebody joins the AARP network of age-friendly communities, they're also joining the World Health Organization's network. And in the US, we have over 530 municipalities that have joined the network. And in Florida, our state joined the network in 2019. That means that the state also signed on to this process and it's being led by their Department of Elder Affairs. And they have an, an initiative called um, Livable Communities, Live Well, Age Out Well, Florida. Here in Florida, in addition to our state, we have 41 municipalities that have joined the network. And uh, you'll see here on the right, there's a, a long list of them. And there's a map that's available with more information, links to the plan or what, what, what uh, location they are in the process of, of this uh, age-friendly community. And livable communities are focused on these eight domains of livability. So they're really focused on the built environment and the social environment, things like our outdoor spaces, transportation, and housing, as well as um, things like respect and social inclusion, social participation, community and, uh, and health systems, communication and information, and civic participation and employment. All of these things need to be considering aging and older adults so that people can age in place in their communities. Here in Miami-Dade, we have an age-friendly initiative 
It's a collaborative effort to create a community where older adults of all ages can stay active, engaged, and healthy with dignity and enjoyment. I wanted to highlight some, some of the work that's happening at a local level so that you see the, the, the breadth of what's going on here in Miami-Dade. We have 11 cities that have joined the network with more that have signed resolutions to join. Uh, we've worked on age-friendly policies. So ensuring that older adults are considered in all policies that are being developed. How will this affect aging and aging in place in our community? We've worked on age-friendly parks, ensuring that there's age-friendly programming and facilities that help people get around the parks as they age. We've looked at age-friendly neighborhoods and planning. And we've also worked on awareness. So ensuring that people understand why we need to be focusing on aging, that we are all aging. And we have this wonderful initiative and partnerships and programs in our community to support aging. The next piece is the age-friendly, in the age-friendly social movement is age-friendly public health systems. So this is focused on the, uh, the health department and health system. So we are all, every one of us, I think on this call is part of this larger public health system, civic groups, nonprofits, home health, doctors, um, healthcare systems, all of us contribute to an age-friendly public health system. And um, in 2017, the Trust for America's Health, funded by the John A. Hartford Foundation, held a convening to start off a pilot um, called a public health framework to support the improvement of health and well-being of older adults. This actually turned into this age-friendly public health systems initiative, and they defined age-friendly public health as comprising three key components. First is promoting health, preventing injury, and managing chronic conditions as well as optimizing physical, cognitive, and mental health and facilitating, and facilitating social engagement. They found that although the public health sector has experience and skills in addressing these components, that older adults weren't traditionally focused on or had a specific uh, attention that, that, we, that they felt that needed to be there. So they developed this framework for age-friendly public health systems and five key potential roles for public health. So these are connecting and convening multiple sectors and professions that provide support services and infrastructure to promote healthy aging. The next is coordinating existing supports and services to avoid duplication of efforts, identifying gaps and increasing access to services and supports. The next is collecting data to assess community health status. Next is conducting, communicating, and disseminating research findings and best practices to support healthy aging. And the last is complementing and supplementing existing supports and services, particularly in terms of integrating clinical and population health approaches. So thinking about healthcare, you can see how this overlaps a lot. And even um, what Dr. Pandya described as the work of the GWEPS program, it's very much aligned with this work. This uh, age-friendly public health system initiative was actually piloted here in Florida and um, they're starting a second phase of that work and now they're expanding it to other states across the country and more information can be found on the transfer uh, the Trust for America's Health website and we'll be sharing these slides after the presentation and last but not least is the age-friendly social movement around age-friendly health systems. This is what we're focused on today. And age-friendly health systems were initiated in 2017 and they recognized that an all-in national response is needed to embrace health and well-being of the growing older adult population. So it's focused on these four Ms and I'm not gonna go into detail because we'll be hearing a lot more, but the idea is that implemented together, these four Ms represent a broad shift to focus on the needs of older adults as they age. And we're so happy that you are here today as part of this age-friendly social movement. And I wanted to highlight that age-friendly policies are at the core of everything that needs to happen here. So that means policies in our healthcare systems and processes in our healthcare systems, in our public health systems, in our communities and cities. And we are here to support this work here in South Florida. Thank you so much. And I'm going to act, introduce to you our next speaker uh, who is going to be talking about the four M's and the role of healthcare practitioners. Dr. Kevin O'Neill is the Chief Medical Officer for ALG Senior 
formerly the Affinity Living Group. Dr. O'Neill graduated from Boston College, magna cum laude, and Georgetown University School of Medicine. He is certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine in both internal medicine and geriatric medicine. He was formerly an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center and is currently a clinical professor in the Department of Aging Studies at the University of South Florida. Dr. O'Neill is a fellow of the American College of Physicians and a certified medical director of the American Medical Directors Association. He formerly served as a chief medical officer of Brookdale Senior Living from 2006 to 2016 and at Ascension Senior Living from 2016 to 2018. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. O'Neill. Thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you so much, Isabel. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Excellent. And uh, it's a real honor to be with you all, and especially to see one of my favorite people in the world, Dr. Pandya, who I've known for quite, some, quite a few years. And so uh, wonderful to co-present with you all on such an important topic. Um, the title of my topic is uh, Introduction to Age-Friendly Health Systems, the Four M's and the Role of Healthcare Practitioners. This is going to be specifically focused on nurses, although it obviously has a relevance to Oh, Dr. O'Neill, I don't hear you anymore. Uh, yeah, oh, can we go right. on to the next slide? Yeah, excellent. I have uh, no relevant disclosures. Third slide. So here are our learning objectives for today. Following the presentation, you should be able to name three reasons for an age-friendly health system. Obviously, there are many reasons for it, but hopefully you can name at least three. Be able to define the geriatric four Ms. Name one way of assessing each of the four Ms and also be able to outline the steps in the PDSA cycle. This is a way of rapid cycle learning and a really a great way of looking at quality improvement. Now, something you should know from the onset, onset of this is that I'm not going to go into detail on every slide here, but they'll be available for your later review. And I'm gonna provide some great resources that can enhance your education on the geriatric 4Ms. Next slide, please. I love this quote by a nurse for nurses. Every nurse was drawn to nursing because of a desire to care, to serve, or to help. Nurses do have an essential role in age-friendly health systems and organizations. Next. The age-friendly health systems was an initiative of the John A. Hartford Foundation, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, in partnership with the American Hospital Association and the Catholic Health Association of the United States the initial goal of the initiative was to rapidly spread the 4Ms framework to 20% of the United States hospitals and medical practices by 2020. However, now that focus has expanded to create, as Isabel mentioned, age-friendly communities. Next. We only have to look at the aging of America to understand how important this, is, this initiative is. There are now 52 million Americans that are 65 years of age or older, and that represents about 15% of the total population. But as Isabel mentioned, within the next 30 years, we're gonna see more than a doubling of this population. Approximately 10,000 people are turning 65 every day. And our population is becoming more racially, ethnically, and culturally diverse. With the aging of the population, we're also seeing an increased healthcare burden due to chronic disease. Indeed, some geriatricians have proposed that we have the geriatric 5Ms, the fifth M referring to multi-complexity, which reflects that many older adults have multiple chronic medical conditions. Next. Age-friendly health systems now include not only hospitals, but medical practices, senior living settings, such as nursing homes and assisted living facilities, senior citizen centers, and even whole cities and towns. These systems follow an essential set of evidence-based practice. One of the major priorities is obviously what the Hippocratic Oath states, which is primum non nutre, which is Latin for first do no harm. It's trying to ensure the safety of the residents and the people that we care for. Age-friendly care also aligns goals of care with what matters to the older adult and their family or other caregivers. This framework makes care of older adults more manageable. The four M's identify the core issues that should drive all decision-making in the care of old, older adults. And the four M's organize care and focus on wellness and strengths rather than solely on disease. 
Next. And this slide shows the forum framework. The first M stands for what matters to people, trying to understand what their preferences are for their care. The second M is for medication, reducing polypharmacy, which we know is a huge problem in the geriatric population, and the use of medications that are, use, that are often inappropriate or seldom appropriate in this population. The third M is fermentation. This recognizes that older adults have a heightened risk of cognitive impairment and mood disorders. This may include various types of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, by far and away the most common type, acute confusional states, referred to as delirium, which is very common in hospital settings, but other care, geriatric care settings as well. Loss of function, a spouse, a home, and independence can contribute to depression and other mental health disorders. The fourth M stands for mobility, which is optimizing physical function in the older adult. This can happen through fitness activities that incorporate resistance exercises and balance training. The CDC's new campaign, Still Going Strong, highlights steps to prevent injury in older adults. Next. This next slide reinforces the fact that 4Ms is not a program, but a cultural shift in how we provide care. It emphasizes that the four M's are not to be isolated from one another, but they're dynamic and meant to be implemented together. Likely you and your health system are already doing some of this already. We must ensure that the four M's are practiced reliably for all older adults in all care settings and across all settings and in every interaction. Next. And this reinforces that this uh, is an infographic that shows how these uh, relationships are synergistic and dynamic. Next. The implementation of 4Ms can lead to many benefits, such as meeting the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services triple aim. And this is something we should have branded into our cerebral cortex, the CMS triple aim. Number one is improving the care quality. Number two is improving the care experience. And we often think of the care experience and that experience by the older adult and their caregivers, but we also wanna make it a good provider experience. And finally, reducing the total cost of care. These goals can be achieved through a reduction in avoidable emergency room visits and unplanned hospitalizations, a reduction of polypharmacy, the use of inappropriate medications and adverse drug events, earlier detection of cognitive impairment, delirium and mental health disorders, and improvements in mobility, gait and balance, and reduction in falls and fall-related injuries. Next. And this slide illustrates the drivers of age-friendly care. For, first, we need to assess the 4Ms. Then we need to act on the 4Ms to achieve this age-friendly care. Next. And this is an infographic that summarizes what I'm gonna address in the following slides, but you can actually use this as a pocket guide that reminds you about the four M's and what you might do in each of these domains to assess the older adult. Next. So let's discuss how we can assess and act on each of the four M's, nurses, healthcare providers, first addressing what matters the aim here is to align care and decisions with the older adults' health outcome goals. That means learning what those goals are. Next. To assess what matters, there are open-ended questions that you can use. Here are a few examples. What is the one thing about your healthcare you most want to focus on so that you can uh, do whatever activity is important to you more often or more easily. What are your more, most important goals now and as you think about the future with your health care? What concerns you most when you think about your health? What are your fears or concerns for your family? What things about your health care do you think aren't helping you and you find too bothersome or difficult? Is there anyone who should be part of this conversation with you? And obviously this applies to end of life care planning, but also um, what that person's desires are for their quality of life and wellness. Next. What is important to you today? What brings you joy? What makes you happy? What makes life worth living? These are all very important questions. Next. So acting on what the person has expressed as their goals for care and documenting that are really important. 
and align that care plan with what matters most. Next. The next is for medications, the next M. Incredible advances in drug therapy over the last century have altered our lives in innumerable ways. People with hypertension, diabetes, heart failure, kidney failure, infectious diseases are living longer and with better quality of life due to medications. But we also have to recognize that drugs can have serious adverse effects as well. Polypharmacy and the use of inappropriate drugs in the elderly can lead to falls, cognitive impairment, strokes, and even death. The late Dr. Mark Beers was a prominent geriatrician who compiled a list of drugs that are considered inappropriate or seldom appropriate in the older adult. These even include over-the-counter medications such as diphenhydramine, Benadryl. I mean, these are commonly available and many folks may not recognize that they can have serious adverse consequences in the older adult. Next. And drugs are often associated with adverse drug events. You know, it's really important to understand that there are very high risk drugs. We know that the benzodiazepines, the anti-seizure drugs that are often being used off label for mood stabilization, folks with dementia can have serious adverse consequences. They have, are independently associated with fall risk. Uh, Noshira, Dr. Pania mentioned about opioids, but muscle relaxants, tricyclic antidepressants and antipsychotics can have serious adverse consequences as well. Next. So you want to act on the medications. If you use those high-risk medications, you can use the Beers criteria as a nice pocket card produced for that. Uh, if you work in a healthcare system, working with your pharmacy provider, uh, there's actually a, uh, it's called a GRAM, a software program that has been developed by the American Society of Consultant Pharma Pharmacologists, pharmacists to uh, address these high-risk drugs. Uh, it stands for the Geriatric Assessment Med Guide. Describe, de-prescribe or avoid high-risk medications and document and communicate those changes. Work with your consultant pharmacists. I often say that geriatrics is a team sport. None of us can do this work alone. It really requires all of us working together, not just doctors and nurses, but pharmacists, social services, therapists, home health hospice. Look at some of the non-pharmacologic interventions that have been shown to be effective for the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. We now know that light therapy, music, aromatherapy, robotic pets can be quite effective and often can reduce or eliminate the need for antipsychotics and benzodiazepines in folks with dementia. Next. When it comes to mentation, it's most, obviously the most significant risk factor for dementia is getting older. The prevalence of Alzheimer's disease doubles every five years after age 65. So it's one to 2% at 65, two to 4% at 70. Uh, by the time someone's 90, it's 50% or more. We had hoped that if you made it to 90 and didn't have dementia, you were safe, but the studies suggest that the trajectory continues the same and that prevalence will continue to increase. So being aware of that and screening for uh, cognitive impairment is really important. Delirium is under-recognized and under-treated. Interestingly, nurses are much better at this than even doctors. Um, you know, studies have suggested that uh, delirium is not recognized probably 50% of the time in nurses and probably 75% of the time by doctors. So it's really important that we understand that if someone has uh, confusion, disorientation, agitation, uh, these can be manifestations. Uh, many folks may have what we call hypoactive delirium. That means that they can seem to be easy to be cared for, but their thinking is disorganized. They're just not connected. So being aware that it's not that just a person who's combative and disoriented and agitated. It could be someone who seems to be very easy to care for. It's very common and hospitalized older adults should be screened for routinely, probably every shift. Uh, and delirium has a high mortality and morbidity if it's not managed appropriately. So being aware of the high risk for delirium in this population. Next. So how do we assess mentation? Well, there are validated uh, tools that are available. These are a few that I'll mention. Screening for cognitive impairment. The mini cog is very simple to do. It can be done within a couple of minutes. It involves a three item recall, drawing the face of a clock, verbal fluency test that can be used. There's another called the Sweet 16, just a few. Screening for delirium. One of the most common screens is the uh, CAM, the confusion assessment method. It's really simple to perform. The nurse delirium screening scale is another. Screening for depression, PHQ-2 is two simple questions uh, and uh, the GDS is uh, 
some more questions has been used more commonly in research settings. But the PHQ2 screen, if it's positive, you can do the PHQ9. But these are simple screening tools that are, are available that can be easily implemented. Next. Acting on mentation. Well, obviously, uh, dehydration, fluid loss, especially in the hot months, uh, are common problems, ensuring people have been adequately hydrated, making sure we're orienting our, our older adults the time, place, and their situation, and making sure they have their personal adaptive equipment if necessary, glasses, hearing aids. We know that visual and hearing loss, sensory deficits can contribute to it, making sure that they've been appropriately fitted, you know, for canes and walkers, uh, making sure that they're being used appropriately. Because these uh, devices, if they're not uh, fitted properly and not in good repair, can actually contribute to fall risk. Minimizing sleep interruptions, um, you know, that's a big problem in the hospitals. You know, how do we reduce the sleep interruptions? Because that can contribute to LERM as well. Using non-pharmacologic interventions that have been proven effective in supporting sleep, and again, avoiding the high-risk medications. Next. When it comes to mobility, there are cost-effective interventions for mobility and fall prevention, knowing what they are. You know, the CDC has a great program, uh, still going strong, that is encouraging physical fitness activities and really promoting the importance of resistance training and balance training. Uh, you know, it's interesting that many older adults may involve in walking programs but they haven't really been shown to be that effective in preventing falls. We want to really try to work and motivate older adults to engage in strengthening activities, resistance exercises, and specific uh, balance activities. Falls occur in one third of older adults, um, as age 65 and older, half of people over age 80, and a significant percentage of them are going to have serious complications, hip fracture, spine injury, head injury, um, so it's a huge public health problem and one that we need to really focus on and address. Next. So assessing mobility, uh, various uh, validated tools have been available. You're probably familiar with the Morse fall sale. The Hendrick 2 fall risk model has been used in the acute care setting. Uh, what I like about the Hendrick 2 fall risk model is it screens for those high risk medications. As we mentioned, the two classes of drugs that are I mean, there are a lot of drugs that can contribute to fall risk. You know, the antihypertensives, the cardiovascular drugs can contribute to orthostatic drops in blood pressure. But two classes of drugs are independently associated with fall risk, and they include the benzodiazepines and the anti-seizure drugs. So, you know, I, I kind of joke with our team that we got to do something about this because it seems like Depakote is a new vitamin D, uh, and it's being used very quite a bit in care settings. And it's not to say that it should never be used, but obviously I think the prevalence of its use has uh, escalated significantly, uh, especially when the black box warning came out about the use of antipsychotics. So again, looking at non-pharmacologic interventions that can hopefully reduce the use of those drugs. Timed up and go test, a simple test to perform that can identify those who may be at more serious risk. A 30 second chair stand, four stage balance tests or other tests that are available. And you can access those on the CDC website. Very easy to perform. Check orthostatic blood pressure. You know, I, when I was in practice, I was just astounded that you know, a resident told me, well, I never had that done before. Well, that could be routine. Uh, someone could have a perfectly normal blood pressure when they're lying down or sitting. And you stand them up and they drop 20, 30, 40 millimeters. Uh, they're going to have problems. So checking orthostatic blood pressure routinely. Consider vitamin D deficiency. You know, the U.S. Preventive Task Force came out and indicated that, uh, you know, otherwise healthy community dwelling older adults, we didn't need to screen for it. But that's not the population that we're dealing with in our nursing homes, and assisted living settings and hospital care settings. So, you know, having a high risk of suspicion, if someone's been falling, consider it and consider supplementation. It has been shown to benefit those who are vitamin D deficient. Check visual acuity, check their footwear, make sure the footwear is appropriate. Again, check those assistive devices, make sure they're not contributing to fall risk. This is where working with our therapy colleagues, occupational therapists, is really helpful. A once a year evaluation by an occupational therapist in the home environment has been shown to reduce some of those extrinsic causes of falls. Next. Act on mobility, encourage those fitness activities that you mentioned, specifically resistance and balance training, 
It's not to say that the aerobic activities aren't important, they are, but really try to get folks uh, doing resistance exercises and specific balance training. Obviously staying away from restraints, removing catheters and other tethering devices when possible, keep, keeping away from those high risk medications and that occupational therapy assessment, and also working with our consultant pharmacists. Next. John Cotter is a professor at Harvard, and I love the work that he's done. Um, one of his famous books is called Leading Change. And I read that book years ago, and it really helped me in my career uh, guiding you know, health systems, uh, guiding our organizations in assisted living and nursing homes. Uh, and the really important part of this is that when you're trying to lead change within your system or your healthcare organization, is you have to create a sense of urgency. But you also have to have leadership buy-in. So it really is important that if you're going to be successful, you have to have the leaders at the top understanding the importance. So create that sense of urgency, help them understand why this is so important. You have to build a guiding, guiding coalition. As we said, this is a team sport. None of us can go it alone. We need to put that guiding team together. Form a strategic vision. You should be able to communicate that, give a little elevator speech of what you're trying to achieve in two minutes or less. Enlist that volunteer army, put that team together, you know, make sure they're committed to the project, remove the barriers that may be standing in your way, generate some short-term wins. Don't try to eat the elephant all at once. You know, look at opportunities you have to make some small tests of change. And once you do that, you know, that helps kind of um, excite the leadership of what, about what you're doing, and then you can build on those short-term wins. Be able to sustain that acceleration as you move forward, and then make those changes that you implement and have been successful part of the lifeblood of your organization. And understand that not all change is going to be positive. You're going to find out things that don't work, but I can tell you that you learn as much from the failures as the successes. You learn what may not work, and, and that's just as important. Next. And this is the PDA cycle, you know, plan what you're going to do, you know, identify the opportunities you have, you know, as we said before, you want to look at the four M's, identify uh, and describe the care that's consistent with those four M's. The next step is designing and adapting your workflow to accommodate that. And then next is doing it. I mean, you don't want to get the paralysis of analysis, thinking about it forever. Eventually you got to jump in and do it, but learn from what you're doing, look at what's working, what isn't study your performance, and then improve and sustain that care. And you can see this is a continual cycle that we call rapid cycle improvement. Next. And I'll just finish with this quote from Dr. Albert Schweitzer, who you know is a, a, a real gifted missionary doctor. He said, the purpose of human life is to serve and to show compassion and the will to help others. And I know that all of you nurses out there, healthcare providers, if you have any therapists, that you are committed to this mission. So uh, it really has been an honor to be with you today. Next. And these are some references to give you more information and education about the 4Ms. Uh, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement has a lot of great resources, even a toolkit, the John A. Hartford Foundation, and uh, Dr. Cotter has a website where you can access uh, resources that he has, learn more about uh, leading change and about the eight-step model for leading change. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Neill. This is wonderful. And we're gonna get to dive into each of these M's in the next, uh, in the next coming weeks. We wanted to uh, stop now. We have a couple of minutes available to for some questions and answers. Um, if if you have a question, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask it, or just put it in the chat, and I can ask that for you. Well, while we wait for those to come in, I have two uh, questions here for you, Doctor. Um, O'Neill, one is, what are the potential benefits for a nurse or a other healthcare provider um, in implementing this 4M framework? Very good. Well, I think the major benefit is simplifying the decision making. You know, when you think about older adults, some of them are coming in with multiple different diseases, you know, 
for multiple medications. I've seen folks with 20, 30 medications. I mean, it's scary when you think about it, maybe a whole litany of chief complaints. So you, you ask yourself, well, where do I start? You know, And I think the concept of identifying what people want is a way to simplify that. So simply ask to begin with, given everything that's going on with you now, what would you most want me to focus on in your health or your healthcare right now? And I think that's a, a great way to use that framework, you know, use those open-ended questions from what matters to kind of focus on where their needs are. Because I, I know from experience, it can be overwhelming. I've had people come in with, with a, you know, a list of 20 different things and, and you can just say, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to handle this in, in a reasonable period of time. But being able to ask them, what on your list would you say are the one or two most important things? Thank you so much. That was a, a great overview. It's really important and I think it's useful um, in so many cases. Um, and I think we have time for one more question. Are there any questions from the participants? I'd like to, uh, as if I can, just bring up the issue of ageism. I mean, what do people think? I think that that's still a barrier, personally. Uh, the attitude towards older adults by the community, by organizations, and sometimes by elders themselves, when they feel that uh, they uh, are impaired by age and fun decline in function, and they don't feel um, they're... Uh, living to their maximum capacity, that actually impairs their health and well-being. So I think ageism is still a barrier. I, I definitely agree. And um, the World Health Organization recently, I, I think last month or the month before, came out with a, a world report on ageism and um, highlighted that this is a really big issue in our community. And we see it in the in even the workforce. And we want people to be choosing geriatrics to be able to um, address you know, our changing population, but in every aspect of our community, we want to make sure that we value our older adults and are really um, understanding why they're so important to our community. It's, it's all of our future, hopefully, if we're lucky enough. So um, we should be, we should uh, embrace aging and embrace older adults in our community. Um, there's a really good um, tool called Reframing Aging that was developed by several um, different nonprofit organizations that we can share as a follow up to this uh, this presentation as well. I was going to just say too that uh, you know to Dr. Pena's point. I mean, all you have to do is look at birthday greeting cards to understand you know the ageism that's so prevalent in our society. I mean, you know, the, many of them portray a, an aging adult as uh, demented, incontinent, uh, frail. Um, and so we've got to do battle with some of the industries out there that are promoting ageism in their advertising and marketing, um, even if it means going to battle with Hallmark. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's just not right. Definitely. Well, I think that's a good stopping point showing we really need to continue this work. Um, and we thank you all for being here today. We would love your feedback and uh, your, imp your, your input via this survey. We're going to put it in the chat as well, or you can scan this QR code with your uh, phone. If you actually um, just hold it up to the camera with your photo app, it will open up a link to the survey. Um, we'd love your feedback to, to understand if, you, um, if this was helpful to you and also to help us in our future trainings. Um, and in addition to that, we want to definitely encourage you to please join us and invite you to join us in the next couple of weeks. Uh, next week, we'll be doing a deep dive into what matters most and mobility. We'll have experts talking about these two M's and some giving some real world examples um, on how this is being addressed in, their, in different um, areas of healthcare. And then the following week, we'll jump into mentation and medication. And in the last week, we're going to 
talk about putting it all together. What are the resources we have here in South Florida? Um, what's available to us? We're also going to talk about ageism and some of the other really important topics that we need to be thinking about, like equity, when we're working on this 4M process. So we hope you'll be able to join us for all of these. We'll also be recording them in case you want to watch them later or share them with your colleagues. And thank you so much for your time today. And I'll, I'll stop and end with this screen if, in case you want our contact information. Thank you again for your time today. We really appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone.